This is Vote Her In, a collaboration between two broads talking politics and author Rebecca Sive. On today's episode, we speak with Gina Glantz, founder of Gender Avenger. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Vote Her In, a collaboration between Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. And we are coming to you in the home stretch of the 2020 election. And as this airs, we'll be 55 days out from November 3rd, which is both exciting and uh, a little scary. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca now, who will introduce our guest. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kelly. I'm glad to be here. You're right. It's a little bit scary, but as you all know, what we try to do here is consult and hear from wise women about what we can do politically and what's next for us and how to really make a difference. So I'm really pleased that our guest today is Gina Glantz, uh, who was one of the co-founders of Gender Avenger. More about that in a minute. Um, but as I was saying before we started the conversation with you, uh, we were chatting a bit, and I realized I really think of Gina as one of the sort of wise women of the women's movement, and I think that she's just has so much to teach us, to share. Uh, we can just learn a lot from her. So by way of introduction, and then we'll just dive in. As I said, Gina is the founder of Gender Adventure. She'll tell us more about that. She also was one of the very early women to run a presidential campaign, and that was for Bill Bradley in 2000. And in the interim, she's done lots of great work on other projects, including uh, work that she and I uh, did together back in the day at NARAL. And so what we thought we would do today, because it's just uh, we're recording on Tuesday, the day after Mike Pence and Kamala Harris were in Wisconsin, Needless to say, a must-win state, as Kelly was probably thinking as she was talking to. Of course, their views on just about everything, including leadership, uh, can't be more different. And so what we thought we would do is, in the light of that contrast, to initially ask uh, Gina to share with us why she started Gender Avenger, in part, as I understand it, to reduce inequities uh, in women's opportunities in the public square, including in political leadership. So I want to read to you uh, the Gender Avenger platform to set the context for this question you know, about why she is doing this work today. So here we are, our mission, a community that ensures women are represented in the public dialogue. Our motto, challenge it, change it. Our mantra, women as equals will become the norm when it is the norm everywhere. And that kind of is my fave for today and probably for a while. So, Gina, welcome. And if you would, share with us. Sure. Rebecca, thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to be here with you and Kelly. Gender Avenger emerged from a moment actually just after the 2012 presidential election. At the time, um, I was teaching at the Kennedy School. I have no academic credentials, but, you know, when you're in politics, sometimes they like you to come and be um, at, the, uh, at the school. And every four years, the Kennedy School does a quadrennial review of presidential politics. They invite the leaders of the campaigns. They invite the press. They have an all-day session. And in the evening, they have a, an event at the Kennedy School Forum, which is the big prestigious place where heads of states and major political figures come and speak to students. And one would think that they would want to model good behavior on such occasions. Well, in 2012, on the stage were five white men. Well, it just sent me around the bend. You know, where was 
Gwen Eiffel? Where was Beth Meyer? Where was Stephanie Cutler? I mean, all of these people had been at the Kennedy School during the day. So I went on my personal Facebook page, which back in those days, when you posted, it went to all your friends. And I said, skipping the quadrennial HKS quadrennial presidential review. I'm tired of all uh, white men all the time. And I got a huge response, loads of likes. Well, that night there was a, <laughs> there was a blackout and they had to cancel. So the next morning I went back on my, my Facebook page and I said, God heard our plaintiff cry. She turned off the lights well, at that point, there were there was like hundreds of uh, likes and dozens of comments, and some of those comments came from people who were important to the Kennedy School, people on the advisory com- committee of the Institute of Politics, and so I then received a rebuke through email, and in that email it said, "How could you say that?" And I said, "It's mm-hmm. really easy." There were five white men on stage. I then began to talk to young women, older women, a variety of people, and discovered that this circumstance was commonplace. And when women would point it out, they would be disparaged, they'd be dismissed, and they wouldn't be invited back to the events. So fast forward, and one day, you know, you wake up, and I thought of the name Gender Avenger, and I, as an organizer... I knew I wanted an organization that would give individuals the tools to make change and the opportunity to have their concerns amplified by an organization perceived to have power that was aligned with their values. And so we created Gender Avenger and its toolkit. I'll very quickly tell you what that means. One is the Gender Avenger Tally, which you can download on any platform, and you can look at your Zoom call and put in the number of men and the number of women and the number of women of color, and if there are any non-binary individuals, and a pie chart will be created uh, with some snarky language at those times when uh, there aren't enough women or aren't enough women of color, and you can instantly post it on uh Facebook, on Twitter, you can download it for Instagram, you can email it, you can even send it anonymously just in case you work for the organization you're smacking. There's another feature of it, which is Who Talks, which you can actually, they're just two buttons, dude, not a dude, and there may be enough women, but all the guys talk too much, so you just hit each button, depending on who's talking, and again, it will show a pie chart of what percentage of the talking uh, and whether that matched the percentage of uh, the gender representation on the on the panel or on the Zoom. So, you know, why does Gender Avenger and what we're trying to do connect to, you know, the politics of this year and ongoing? It's really no different, whether it's politics or it's tech. If you're seen, if you're heard, you are thought of as powerful, as a leader, an expert. Right. Without that public voice, regardless of your talent, regardless of your skills, even regardless of your position sometimes, you're not given the same profile that someone who has that platform and that public platform is. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah. What sorts of advice strategies do you have for individual women who are interested in making sure that uh, that they have more of a voice, that they're in the public eye, maybe they're starting professional or uh, political careers, or maybe they're, you know, sort of trying to move up. But, you know, what should individual women be doing? What can they be doing to make sure their voices are being heard? I'll tell you a story from my personal background of many, 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 many many years ago. Ruth Mandel, the wonderful founder of the Center for the American Women in Politics, uh, called me up. She was uh, 
from New Jersey as I was after I had run a successful campaign, which no one thought was going to be successful and said, Gina, you have to go out and speak. You have to be a woman who shows this can be done. And I was like, what? She said, no, here's what you do. First, you pick the friendliest audience because no one is born a really good speaker. So you pick a friendly audience, you go and, you know, you speak to them, you ask, you say you have something to say, you get on their agenda. And, you know, for young women today, it doesn't have, you don't have to start out on your local TV station. You can start out at your local school board meeting. You can start out at, you know, a local uh, organization you belong to and just begin to feel comfortable in front of other people stating, you know, what you have to say. And so I'd say, first of all, dare to be public. And the other part of it is don't be deterred. You know, keep at it, keep finding opportunities, keep inserting yourself. And, you know, the sun comes up every day. So if you get turned down or it doesn't go perfectly, don't worry about it. Because the more opportunities you find will create that opportunities will find you. You know, one of the things about finding those opportunities, and, and um, I actually talk quite a bit about this in my book, book we're in, but, you know, and I sort of encourage, not sort of, I ask women to engage as activists in the public arena, specifically in politics. And I do make that same point that you're making, which is that there are many places to be involved and many ways to be involved. And I wonder if you could share with us in that context of what Ruth suggested, you know, go out and speak to people and try to convince them about something you think is right. You know, what kind of activities would you really focus on if you were, for instance, a young woman just getting started in political campaigns as a volunteer, but realize that this election is just, you know, beyond belief in terms of how important it is. How would you counsel them to proceed? I think there, uh, there are a couple of ways. First of all, if you're going to volunteer in a campaign, don't necessarily do what you want to do. Don't go and say, I'll write a position paper or, you know, I'll do the, do what they need. If they need someone to make fundraising calls, even if you're uncomfortable, make fundraising calls for them. That's almost a form of public speaking. It's having to make these calls or making, you know, a persuasion calls. Um, and, you know, I think, interestingly enough, this kind of bizarre world we're living in, where we're more looking at each other on a computer screen than standing in front of a meeting, could be a very big opportunity even if you, because you belong to an organization that you say to them, you know, why don't we have a, you know, video chat with some group of women or men and women, and I want to talk about the campaign I'm working on, or I found something neat to do over here, um, which, you know, through three organizations that do, you know, calling from your computer to get out the vote, whatever it happens to be, you know, just find a way to be in front of people. And I think that in this year, you know, there are many organizations that have put together sophisticated programs that you can participate in, but you can also do it neighbor to neighbor where you live. You know, if, if you live in the suburbs, right, then reaching to your neighbors and asking them to reach to other neighbors and doing it perhaps, you know, through a video conversation uh, could be a very effective way to help the campaign. It may seem small, but given this election, if you talk to 100 people over the next, you know, couple of months and 10 of them vote who wouldn't have voted or 10 of them know about a record, you know, of you know, Trump or Pence that they didn't know about, you will have made a contribution to the outcome. And in that context, I love this expression of yours about dare to be public. Uh, is there a, a, 
a sort of gender, a vendor piece to this work that uh, we're going to be doing over these next 55 days that you think, you know, add some value to our individual activities? I'm glad you asked me that question because you know, we are a 501c3 with all the restrictions that come with it. But a couple of things we did so far, and something that just occurred to me that your listeners might uh, find fun to do, um, is one of the things we did is we counted the speakers at both the Democratic and the Republican conventions. And, you know, the Democratic convention won what is called our, uh, you know, stamp of approval, a gold stamp of approval for having at least 40% of women of whom 50% were women of color in speaking right on during the convention on the Republican side, they actually had a fair number of women, but we did out that there were more Trump relatives who were women who were speaking (laughs) than there were women of color speaking. So you can find an angle to you know, display something of importance. But what occurs to me, Rebecca, is if folks download the gender event tally, you right. can watch the television coverage, uh, the Sunday shows, who they have on, who talks during the blathering of uh, you know, what's happening, <laughs> um, and you know, use that to make to help sort of inform people of the uh, balance of men and women's voices interpreting this campaign. And if someone just did that for a week, they might be able to, you know, find a way to uh, get in front of a group to talk about what they learned. Oh, what a great idea. That's terrific. Yeah, it's really person to person based on immediate information. what gender venture is known for is, you know, the data. We virtually do nothing that is subjective when we do our action alerts, which I hope some people will sign up so they can receive them. We have to see it and be able to count it before we, you know, condemn or we celebrate it, right? <laughs> and mm-hmm. the great right. part about that, if you are looking to speak, is no one can say it didn't happen. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that's been so interesting about the Biden campaign, uh, you know, in addition to, of course, choosing a woman as the vice presidential candidate, is how many women are the ones running the campaign, you know, all the way up uh, to campaign managers and their senior advisors, even the recently announced uh, transition staff, so many women involved. Uh, but it's really taken a long time to to get there from when you were running Bill Bradley's campaign in 2000 to now, 20 years later, to, to finally see this. Why do you think that it, it took so long uh, to get to this point where women are really succeeding, you know, in, in running things? Right. And, uh, you know, what what are sort of the, the lessons that we can learn from that? Well, you know, we have progressed. Uh, certainly from the first campaign I ran was before most of your listeners were born in 1974. <laughs> before I was born. <laughs> uh, and this was a startling victory uh, because we, it was a congressional race against the dean of the Republicans, the longest serving Republican in a Republican district. And there was a profile done of me in the newspaper where I was referred to as a perky suburban matron. Well, first of all, let me tell you, I have never been described as perky in my (laughs) When I was 12, I wasn't perky. Um, And, you know, from there to, you know, Bill Bradley, you know, to today, it takes a long time. It takes a long time, frankly, to break through you know, the establishment patriarchy that exists in this country. And, you know, I think even when political consultants, most of whom were men, understood the value of the women's vote, 
it took them a long time to understand the value of women's experience in contributing to how the campaign should be conducted, what the message should be, what the best way to reach people, you know. And so it has been a slog. Um, and it is wonderful what is happening um, today, but it is insufficient that it's just happening today. We have to keep at it. We have to keep watching. We have to watch who becomes part of the government. We have to watch, you know, what happens on staffing um, throughout the government, whether it's in the Congress or it's in the White House or, you know, whether it's within organizations locally that are tied to politics. If we're not diligent, it will fall back. At the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, I just, I wrote something about this because I looked at television and all the epidemiologists, all the so-called experts were men. And women were cast as caring, nurturing, next to the patient, doctors and nurses but not as the experts. And it was though, as though we defaulted to the sense that men were experts. So I am encouraged and excited by obviously Kamala Harris and all the people within the Biden campaign uh, who hopefully will be the public voices going forward um, and women who can really demonstrate to young women and to we old codgers who want to see change that women really have a platform going forward. So speaking of having the platform, speaking of the hallmarks of change, one of the things certainly for several generations, hopefully every generation of feminist political activists has been uh, the mantra, I'm pro-choice and I vote. And of course, you've spent a lot of your time uh, in the reproductive rights world, including chairing the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Can you share with us you know, how that fits into this uh, larger context that you've described of being concerned about equality, so there's gender avenger, being concerned about women in politics and the public square, why you see that issue as a cornerstone? Well, Sadly, that issue lives on. And so you you have to be forever diligent. You know, um, you know, Vice President Pence is one of the scariest human beings on the planet when it comes to women's health. And You know, there's so much else going on in the country today that it's not necessarily that this issue will rise up. But being able to show, you know, the what they have done to the courts and how that will affect uh, the ability for Planned Parenthood and independent clinics to carry out their work. Um, and for women to have access, and in particular, uh, low-income women to have access, um, it's just, it's just terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have to really sort of keep the pedal to the metal. Um, You know, I, I went to college before your parents were born. Um, Anyway, and I had a friend in college, this was pre-Roe, who went to Mexico to have an abortion and came back unable to have children. And I think that, you know, that really hurt me. Obviously it hurt her more. And, you know, over the last, whatever it is, 50 years, yes, we've made progress, but we fall back as much as we go forward. And so, um, you know, I just, and, and let me say, We've talked a little bit about, you know, suburban women. So if you can find all those perky suburban matrons, um, (laughs) they often care about this issue. 
Um, you know, there was a, a time in the 90s when Roe was threatened in the Supreme Court. And there was a two-year election period where suburban women, suburban Republican women, drove the election of Democrats. And we should be able to do that again this year. You know, I've made that exact analogy in a couple of conversations recently. As I, I recall, you know, for those of us in Chicago, DuPage County was this, you know, Republican land. And all of a sudden, all these women were voting for the pro-choice Democratic candidates. So I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that uh, Trump is trying to make this election about the suburbs. And, you know, so what you're saying about what what's really driving suburban women, uh, I think, is completely different than what the Republicans seem to think is driving suburban women. That's right. And, and I think, obviously, it's a combination of things. You know, I would argue that the issue of abortion is a powerful one for many suburban Republican women's, women. I believe that Trump's vicious law and order, you know, kind of whistles that watch out who's coming to your neighborhood, that, you know, responsible, caring women, Republican and independent women in the suburbs, that makes them uncomfortable. So we have a combination of things which I think can undermine uh, the uh, uh, the Republicans, and even the president. So you talked some earlier about ways that uh, that our listeners can use the, the tools from Gender Avenger, uh, especially in this election cycle. You know, what can you sort of uh, tell us a little bit about more about how they how they get to, to Gender Avenger, how to how to access uh, the the things that that you have available for them to use, uh, and you know how how we might deploy that now in the next fifty five days. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the conversation. So it's really easy. You just go to www.genderadventure.com, and you'll see. It's really easy to download the app. You'll see we have something called the pledge, which asks men not to appear on panels where there are no women. So if there are men in your life, uh, you can ask them to do that because I think by asking, it kind of alerts them right to the issue, mm. the issues that will come up around this campaign. Um, I think that uh, there is a, you know, an opportunity, as I said, to kind of use the tally in a variety of ways, which I think your listeners will discover when they discover it, um, to just be able to highlight and send to their community, in particular their social media community, to inform them of mm-hmm. what is happening. And if they tag Gender Avenger, then we will retweet and right because even if someone does something political. If we're tagged, we can retweet it as long as they don't say, you know, vote the bastards out. Oh, <laughs> you know, vote the bastards out. You can, you can uh, bleep me on that. <laughs> you know, vote them out. So, Gina, thank you so much for joining us. I think that, you know, I was thinking as we were coming together, I, I talked at the beginning of the conversation. I mentioned that Gina is a wise woman. She's also one of those strong women. And so please join her and those of us who've become enthusiastic supporters of Gender Avenger and help it become even stronger. We, you know, these ideas of hers for us to share in our communities are vital over these next uh, few weeks. So thanks so much, Gina. We really appreciate it. Thank you to you both. The Vote Her In segment is a collaboration of Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. Our segment editor is Rachel Wallstad. Our theme song is called Are You Listening off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.